Well, welcome to our class tonight. Uh, before we begin, let me pray for us. Lord, uh, we ask for your spirit to help us tonight to understand your truth more clearly, even as we look at uh, distortions of your truth, um, that we might better understand our own faith and know how to defend it and help us to appreciate it, Lord, the truths that we hold dear. Um, Lord, help us to appreciate it in a practical way and give you praise. So we pray for your guidance tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you see on your notes there, um, we're kind of taking a, a different path tonight. We've covered a number of the main high points in terms of development of doctrine in the early church, and we're kind of moving towards the Reformation. But I thought it would be helpful and interesting, perhaps, to, to do a one-off lesson on Roman Catholicism uh, and Roman Catholic theology, especially leading up to and shortly after what we call the Reformation, to help us to understand by way of contrast uh, our heritage better. So I've entitled it Contrast in Theological Heritage, the Council of Trent, which will be our, our main focus. I'll mention some other things along the way. But uh, just by way of you know introduction, I, my goal here is not to, or with anything, any opposing view, we should never merely create a straw man of the other side and tear it down and make fun of it. But we should you know, confront legitimate error and understand those errors uh, and try to best understand where the other side's coming from, from their own writings, from their own documents. And that's what we'll try to do in the short time we have tonight. Um, so hopefully that'll be beneficial. Now, just to, by way of introduction also, just throw out a question. Who in here has uh, a Roman Catholic background or some sort of, okay, Mike? Anybody else grow up in that context? Or For me personally, I did not, but I grew up in the Midwest, and you, know, you either went to public school or you went to Catholic school. So I had a lot of friends that were Catholics, a lot of Catholic and Lutheran uh, churches where I grew up. Um, so heard bits and pieces, and probably for most of us, Mike probably is more the expert than the rest of us <laughs> in terms of you know, the teaching and, and what actually is done. We kind of hear bits and pieces, and we kind of draw some conclusions, but we may or may not be accurate. I, I would also add Jeff to it. I know he's studied uh, Roman Catholicism also. But uh, and feel free to chime in along the way uh, if you feel like you could add something to our discussion. But yeah. Let me say one thing is that it's kind of funny. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> growing up, uh, we were in our house and someone said something really nice about this lady, about what she'd done. And, uh, and then my, my mother says, she's Catholic. <laughs> 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 you know, in other words, we had a small, small Catholic church in, in South Georgia. And they were like, people had, you know, just, they were drunk. But it yeah. was so funny, my mother said, oh, she's Catholic. <laughs> and then, you know, like those people could do anything good. And it goes both ways, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's stereotypes and prejudice against other groups. and uh, But hopefully from tonight we'll gain, gain a little bit more understanding uh, as we go along. Now, some preliminary questions there. Uh, I think I put that on your notes. One question that comes up, you know, when did the Catholic Church become Roman Catholic? You know, and that's kind of a difficult question to answer uh, with definite, uh, indefinite terms. But we might say, uh, first of all, that Roman Catholic is actually a contradiction in terms. That name. Remember what we talked about in terms of Catholic when we talked about the Apostles' Creed. We talked about it meaning universal, but even more specifically and theologically, it means the invisible church, which does have a visible expression in the world, but the invisible church more directly 
speaks of the elect of God who have been united with Christ, which is through time. And it's from every nation, every tongue, tribe, and language, and nation. And there's one head to the church, Jesus Christ, in heaven at the right hand of the Father, reigning on high. There's no earthly head to the church, just speaking in broad terms here, quoting the scriptures. And Roman, the, the title Roman is by definition, particular. Nothing Catholic about that in terms of our understanding of Catholic. Now, what is meant by Roman Catholic Church among, among Catholics is you know, that there's this external, visible church that's throughout the world under this visible earthly head, and it's a mechanical organization, more so than we might say, a spiritual unity with Christ, the risen Christ. So it's an ecclesiastical, mechanical unity rather than an emphasis on the spiritual unity. Um, And strictly speaking, only Protestants believe in a Catholic church in in the sense that we're talking about, the universal, invisible church. We might also add that Roman or the Roman church is not in any ancient creed that we've looked at. So when was it identified in terms of Roman Catholic or when was that distinction made? Well, that's that's a complicated question in terms of history, but you might point to things like the split of the Eastern and Western church in terms of where is the where is the see of the Pope? You know, where is the headquarters? <laughs> is it in Rome or is it in you know, Constantinople or where is it? There's, a, there's all kinds of things going into play there politically and, and ecclesiastically. Um, so Rome sort of gets designated as, as a spot. And we might say also that Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church beca- really forms its identity in the council that we're going to look at tonight and then some subsequent councils. It gets entrenched and defined as the Roman Catholic Church. So that sort of addresses that question to a degree. The second is, you know, what about the origin of these, what we might call notorious doctrines that seem strange to us? Prayers for the dead, purgatory, uh, the intercession of Mary and the saints and all of this. Well, I'm not, we don't have time to get into each one of those little things. I'm really going to focus on some main differences um, with what we would say is our heritage theologically. But all of those traditions, and there's a number of them, if you looked on a chronological layout of when these things were in, they've, they've kind of been in play for a long time, you know, earlier than the Reformation, Um, Some go back way far, some not till the 19th century. So they're kind of scattered throughout, but in these councils and and formalized uh, written documents, they sort of gain official status. They've been in play from, you know, different periods of time to a certain degree, but then they become sort of crystallized in these documents. So... um, the story of these traditions is really more of a gradual development. Um, and many are crystallized in the Council of Trent that we're going to look at tonight. So let's look at that. The Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563. Um, some his- historical context here. Um, the the, the, the Catholic Church at that time was really widespread in many different parts of the world. And there's a lot of danger, you know, of different teachings and different ideas that could creep in. Um, and there was really a fear of heresy to a large degree. And you get the Inquisition and other things going on historically. So they're, they're widespread. There's, there's dangers out there in terms of heresy. There's also corruption within the clergy and the popes, you know, from time to time. Not, not that they were all equally bad or anything like that, but there was 
even acknowledged within the Catholic Church, corruption that needed to be addressed. Many of the priests were immoral and even illiterate at the time. Um, there were some efforts within the church to reform it. Um, famous names like John Huss, William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, these guys, um, you know, they, they had a high view of Scripture. Um, they were against the abuses and the immorality among the clergy, and they made efforts to take a stand, and some of them paid dearly. John Huss, in particular, burned at the stake uh, in 1415 as a heretic for saying things like, the Bible's the only authority. Christ is the only head of the church. Only God can forgive sins. And the popes can't establish doctrine contrary to the scriptures. That's what he was burned for. And then probably the biggest historical factor at the time was the Reformation had already been launched. You know, Luther, Calvin, others were active leading up to this council. So this Council of Trent was really the Roman Catholic response to the Reformation. And there's some positive things that they responded with, and then, as we'll look at, negative things. Positively, they acknowledged that the clergy needed to be reformed morally. You know, they needed to be educated. They needed to be, you know, get their act together. And we would all agree that that's always a good thing within the church. But the negative reaction is that they, and you'll see this in the tone of the documents, they're very pointed against the reformers, referring to them as heretics, and who believe such things should be accursed, or let them be anathema, as we've used that term before. So they, in, this, in these documents, they really crystallize and formalize and entrench themselves in the teachings that were circulating within the church up to that time. Just to give you an idea of the tone, the negative tone in this document, there's over a hundred anathemas. So what did the canons and decrees of Trent contain? And that's what they were called. Um, the decrees are sort of the the formalized uh, positive statements of doctrine and the canons are those who teach contrary to this, let them be accursed. And I gave you the dates earlier. It almost took them 20 years to finish this document. There were 25 separate doctrinal sessions that were held. Um, many of the first half of them were discussing formalities and logistics of how the things were to proceed. But there were a number of doctrinal um, sessions as well, and we're going to talk about some of those. But they discussed things such as uh, doctrinally. Um, first of all, they accepted the Nicene Creed, gave formal, yeah, we again reaffirmed that, and we would say, that's good. Um, and then they go on to talk about original sin, justification, the sacraments, various things related to that, the seven sacraments. Um, but then lastly, things like purgatory, veneration of the saints, indulgences, things like that. So theological emphases, and this is really what I want us to focus on of all the things that we could talk about. This is very important because you'll see the difference between what we would say is our theological heritage from what the Roman Catholic tradition is. In session four, they talk about authority, scripture, revelation, and tradition. And it's very clear that scripture and tradition were given equal weight in determining what a Christian ought to believe. Um, it states that unwritten traditions 
that have been passed down through the church were dictated by the Holy Spirit. And they're to be received with equal reverence as with the Scriptures. And that dictation sort of passed down through the succession of popes is sort of the implication. Now, I've used this quote before in another context, but, and maybe this is an extreme sort of expression of their view. It may be, but um, this was one of the Roman Catholic responses by Priarius to Luther's 95 Theses. He says, Whoever does not hold fast, this is much earlier than Trent, this is 15, 17-ish. Um, Trent, again, is in the mid-16th century. But he says, Whoever does not hold fast to the teachings of the Roman Church and of the Pope as the infallible rule of faith from which even the Holy Scripture draws its strength and authority is a heretic. So he's writing against Luther's statement. Um, The canon of Scripture that's affirmed in these documents includes the Apocrypha, six extra books, um, in addition to the 39 Old Testament and 27 New Testament books. Even saying, those who reject these additional books, let them be accursed. And it says that the, the church is the judge of the interpretation of Scripture. Not to privately interpret Scripture in any way contrary to the church's interpretation, which is authoritative. We'll get to the contrast of what the reformers were saying that's different about that. And then they also affirm that uh, the, the old Latin Vulgate edition is the official edition of the church. Later on in subsequent councils, they kind of backstep a little bit on that. Uh, Now, how does that contrast from what we believe in our heritage? Well, many have pointed out that the formal principle, the foundational principle of the Reformation, is as important as justification by faith is, this goes even deeper, in a sense. And it's the doctrine of Scripture. Because once you mess with that, then you can mess with all the other doctrines, can't you? So the formal principle of the Reformation is really an issue of authority. And this is where we get the Reformation a doctrine of sola scriptura. Which, if you want to define it, the Bible alone is the Word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And that's basically what's stated in our confession, chapter 1. What I find interesting is when you read the documents of Trent, they do have footnotes of proof texts for these various articles. Well, the one on Scripture, guess how many proof texts? Zero. If you compare that to the Westminster Confession, chapter 1, there's 52 proof texts for what's stated about the doctrine of Scripture. Um, Such things in our Westminster Standards as the canon is closed. There's no more special revelation through any individual um, or pronouncement by a church leader. The books are listed out in chapter 1. There's 66 books that are recognized as the canon of Scripture. The Apocrypha is mentioned as a human work that may be valuable in a historical sense, but it is not authoritative or inspired on the level of Scripture. And Scripture is self-attesting in its authority. It's not dependent upon man or the church to tell us if it's it's authoritative or not, or God's Word or not. It's self-attesting. And if you think about it, any ultimate authority is self-attesting. Because you have to, if you have to appeal to a, something else to confirm it, then that's the ultimate authority, not the thing you're talking about. And the final appeal, this I'm, again I'm citing now from the confession, paraphrasing, the final appeal of the church is to the scriptures in their original languages, 
but translation of the original languages is legitimate and useful and necessary for the uh, proclamation of the gospel throughout the world. And then this, getting back to the, what's the rule of faith and practice or the, even the rule of interpretation? Remember, it was the church's official interpretation of the scriptures that's authoritative. Well, the, the reformers, as we have in our confession, says the, the only infallible rule of interpretation is what? Scripture itself, scripture interpreting scripture. You see, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but this is important. The scriptures come to us pre-interpreted by God. Yes, we interpret, but we do so in submission to the scripture's own interpretation of itself. This speaking of this, this clarifying that, this connecting with that. And it's pre-interpreted by God. So we don't provide, we don't supply an interpretation that's not already there, that's authoritative. We submit and we learn to interpret according to the scriptures and how the scriptures interpret themselves. Does that make sense? Um, It's not dependent upon the church to provide that. In fact, the authority of the church depends on the authority of scripture, not the other way around. So that's sort of an important scripture alone. And we'll see this time and time again. Why did the reformers, you know, with these solas, why, why this? Because you see that the Catholic Church uses scripture, justification by faith, in Christ, by grace, but they don't use alone. And there's a big difference. The word alone makes all the difference in many of these cases. So the second main thing I want to talk about is what many call the material principle of the uh, Reformation, justification. This was sort of what was more obviously disputed, though that other scripture doctrine is foundational for one's understanding of justification. So what did Trent say about this doctrine? Well, notice it begins, this is in session six. <clears throat> this, by the way, was the, took the longest to produce. It took six months for them to articulate the section on justification. But they began by saying things like this. Man cannot justify himself. We are justified through Christ. Those are the early sections of uh, their doctrine of justification. And this is a good time to point out that this is common among doctrinal error throughout the history of the church. To sound the same, but mean something different. As the subsequent paragraphs go on to explain, they mean something very different than what we understand justification to be. Um, And so that's a transferable principle to look for among heresy. Uh, Things raised up against Christ is using the same language in the verbiage, yet meaning something different. That's a deceptive tactic uh, of the enemy. So those things being the case that sounds good up up till now but then they talk about man must freely assent and cooperate with God's grace and in doing so and I quote man converts himself into his own justification but he said that he can't justify himself he would they would say well he can't justify himself by himself but with Christ Man doing his part, Christ doing his part. Together, we achieve justification. So man must, there's a section on how to prepare oneself for justification. And in there it talks about man must repent and believe prior to 
justification. They say that Christ merits justification for us, but it must be applied through the sacrament of baptism. So that's another angle in here that's a foreign element. That through just, it sort of begins justification for a person to be baptized that removes their original sin, gets them on the justifying track. And when I say baptism, I don't mean baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean actual water baptism, the sacrament of baptism, the, the performing the very act actually effects justification. And that's, again, very different than we would view the sacraments. Um, and then this is an, another important difference. It involves infused righteousness within us. So it's not just one standing before God, as we'll talk about in our uh, Westminster definition of justification, but it involves holiness in your life that's part of your justification within you, not from solely from without, sort of imputed to us, but it's something we work out as part of our justification. As they say, man must keep his new robe spotless, as it says in the, in the document. Now against the heretics in this context, they're talking about the reformers. They say that confidence and certainty with respect to one's justified state cannot be rested upon. You cannot know if you are justified by faith alone. That's merely, as it says, flattering yourself before God. It says, and I quote, no man can know with a certainty of faith that he has obtained the grace of God. You cannot know if you're justified in this life not with any certainty. And as I said, because justification is this, involves this infused righteousness lived out in our lives, uh, it's a process. It's a, it's, it's a lifelong justifying process that you have to go through, that you're involved in. So you can increase in your justification. You know, your works are strengthening it. In addition to the grace that you receive from Christ, but it's added to it. And they talk about praying for an increase in virtue, meaning that you increase your justification. They also say, <laughs> I guess this is a pointed attack on the reformers, that they say that those who assert that even our best works are tainted with sin are opposed to the orthodox doctrine of our religion. So if you say we're still you know, are tainted by sin even in our best works, as some of our reformers have said, and beyond that earlier in the church, that's opposed to the truth. So what are some observations here? What we see is a consistent confusion of the doctrines of justification and sanctification. And it's really contrary to how Scripture speaks of those things. They've, they've, they've turned justification from this one act of God applying, you know, imputing Christ's righteousness to you in your conversion, and they laid it on its side and made it a process, a timeline, thing that you've got to work out and grow in. Where we would say, you know, you're justified by God, by His grace, imputed righteousness of Christ from without. And then that begins the process of sanctification where you're being conformed gradually uh, according to the image of Christ. And so there's this confusion of justification and sanctification and they are opposed, as I said earlier, to the solas. You know, the, they don't like the word alone, at least in how they're expressing these doctrines. Now, um, one one thing to point out in their in their doctrine of original sin. You remember last time we talked about the doctrine of man with Pelagius and Augustine. 
we talked about original sin and, you know, Pelagius basically denied original sin. But there were others who had a semi-Pelagian view that didn't deny it but said it really wasn't so, uh, so much of a handicap upon man. He's not dead. He's just sick and weakened by sin. So he just needs a little help. He can't do it on his own, but he can do some things. Well, really, you know, their doctrine of original sin is very anti-Pelagian. But I would argue to say, in light of the whole document, they're semi-Pelagian in their expression. They don't deny original sin, but they, they act as if man has ability. Even though there's sections that say he's unable, yet they, they continue in, in their explanation, he does have ability and he's contributing to his justification. So that's just a tie-in from last time. So how does this contrast from what we believe? Um, I'm going to read here because this is a great definition from the Shorter Catechism. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. So it's very clear that it's an act of God alone and it's Christ's righteousness imputed to us from without. Not righteousnesses that we're doing, working out for ourselves. Um, that's why sometimes it's referred to as an alien righteousness, you know, coming from another, Christ. That's how we're justified. And then it's interesting, you know, I talked about that confusion of justification and sanctification. In the larger catechism, question 77, it talks about the differences of justification and sanctification. It shows how they're distinct, not separate. You know, if we're justified, we will be sanctified. They go, you know, it's part of the package, but they're not the same thing. And our standards make that clear. And I think that's sort of, again, a response to the confusion. Um, and remember, our Westminster Standards is about 100 years later than the Council of Trent, just to give you some historical marker there. Now, we could go on and talk about church where I put mentioned in there other things like church worship and sacraments. These are very distinctive and very different understandings of these things, but we're not going to take the time tonight to look at that. Um, but, you know, the use of images and all of these things um, are part of that. So maybe another question that comes up is, well, okay, that wasn't a good document. Trent was bad. It was, you know, the rhetoric was very negative and extreme all these curses and whatnot. Hasn't it gotten better over time? I mean, with subsequent uh, councils and documents, you know, has the, you know, we closer than we were kind of thing. What's been the development since Trent? Well, I just, again, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm just going to be very brief here. But there's two major councils um, since that time, Vatican I and Vatican II. Vatican I was in the, in 1870, it largely affirmed Trent and it affirmed papal infallibility when speaking ex cathedra or speaking officially in terms of matters of faith and, and morality. So that doesn't seem like a, a softening, it seems like an entrenching, really. So that papal infallibility really its formal status at that point. It was, the idea was around before then, but that was really a benchmark. And also it affirmed the, the Pope's universal jurisdiction over all Christendom, basically, uh, in terms of his authority. It wasn't just over Rome or all churches. Um, and then Vatican II, which was in the 1960s. So that's pretty recent. Um, all I'll say about this is what was unique about this particular one is that 
there was no particular doctrinal dispute or issue that was the occasion for this Vatican II Council. Rather, they, they, they wanted to do three things, basically. They wanted to update their religion and their tradition. They, want, they wanted to return to the sources, and what they mean by return to the sources is, you know, more of, let's go back to the older pastoral language uh, of our tradition and of scripture and translate that to the 20th century. So they changed their liturgies and the sort of the way they worded things and language. Try to, you know, more pastoral, more friendly, you know, or a more friendly uh, approach as opposed to the anathemas and all of that. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of development of doctrine, really. It was more of a development of tradition, emphasizing a living tradition, not a, something trapped in the past or something that's out of date or not relevant, but a tradition that can be adapted to the modern world. So they, they preferred positive declarations versus anathemas. Um, they encouraged the use of translations in other languages, you know, as the clergy saw fit to, to use, to m be most effective. Um, bishops were given more authority than they had before. Um, they talked about Christ as the revelation of God, but it's in, he's encountered in two streams, scripture and tradition of the church. So there's really nothing new here. Um, but maybe it's more winsomely presented, softer language and that kind of thing, but really not any official changes in terms of the things we've already mentioned. They even maintained a high Mariology, um, claiming at the same time that it no, in no way obscures or diminishes Christ as mediator, which begs the question, well, how? <laughs> you know, how is that the case? Now, here's one interesting development. It's, I would call this more um, worldview-related. While not denying that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church, which they've always maintained, um, they reject nothing of what is true and holy from other religions. Eastern faiths, things like that. And they say, those, you know, those things that are shared by the Catholic Church. That raises a whole host of questions. What truth is there in other religions, at least from the, the biblical standpoint? I mean, is there something legitimate being done in other religions? You know, do you, do you see in the scriptures God talking about the nations and their idols and say, you know, you know, confront the, you know, Assyrians for their idolatry, but, you know, they got some good things too. I just don't, you know, you just don't see that in scripture. If the worldview is fundamentally flawed in the way that scripture talks about in terms of sinful man and his rebellion against God, suppressing the truth, no one doing good, no one searching after the truth, what is there to be valued as holy and true in these other religions? Um, they also affirmed a political freedom of religion. And I, I thought this was interesting. They say even if the, the religion is untrue, freely expressing that untrue religion was a right of human dignity. And I would say before whom? Is that a human right and dignity before God? Is that something to be valued? To be worshiping idols contrary to his word? So there is a, you can see this push to be friend, you know, a friendlier push to the world, to, you know, probably under the motive of, well, to reach the world, we, we need to be like this. And then it also had statements about things like human rights, social justice, world peace, economics, things like that. So it's very kind of a political um, 
element to it. Now, there was, I'm just going to mention this in passing, there was a joint declaration on justification between the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church in 1999. And uh, I don't know if any of you, Jeff, have you read that? I don't know who all was involved in it. I can't remember, but bottom line is it wasn't wholly adopted or endorsed by either side because <laughs> it was a small sample that was pushing this from within both camps. But it was trying to, re- their, their main motive was try to remove these anathemas from Trent because they were very, on justification, it was very clear, you know, if you're not buying this, you're accursed which would include all you know, reformers and Lutherans and others at that time. And so the contemporary Lutheran church, I don't know what composed this contingent of Lutherans, if they were on the left-leaning side or whatever, but um, you know, they, they met together, they had these discussions, they put a statement out, and you can find it online, a PDF of it. There's 44 statements or little mini paragraphs about it. And I read through them, and they acknowledge some differences, but they try to emphasize the consensus that they're saying the same thing largely about justification. And they're open to using the same language to talk about justification. But that doesn't, as we've talked about in here, that's not the whole picture. Just because you use the same verbiage doesn't mean you mean the same thing. So the, I think the jury's still out on what they mean by those words. Um, and there's still there's a still heavy element of uh, the Roman Catholic understanding of baptism, the physical act of baptism as part of our justification. That's still in there. So I'll, you know, again, there's no universal consensus on either side. So it's kind of they're dialoguing, but I'm not seeing much development or accomplishment there. So has the Roman Catholic Church improved upon its past from what we would say from Trent? I would say despite its efforts to promote a friendlier, more winsome tone and practical engagement with other groups and dialogue, its doctrines remain the same. Essentially, they are the same. They may not talk about it. They may not even teach it consistently. Um, But they're still there. And they have not been removed or denied or changed substantially. In fact, Robert Godfrey, he's one of the Ligonier guys, if you've read anything by him, he argues in an article that, that, uh, about Calvin's interaction with the Roman Catholic Church of his day, he would have concluded that Rome is actually worse off today than they were at the time of the Reformation. You may think, well, how is that possible? Um, He says, because not only have they kept their teachings that run contrary to Scripture, but they've also added liberalism and modernism to those things. So even their, you know, Scripture and tradition, they at least held the Scripture was formally, you know, an authority from God in addition to tradition, uh, now you have Catholic scholars who are on the liberal side who deny inspiration or deny aspects of what we might say would be the old understanding, at least partly of Scripture back at the time of Trent. So there's philosophical currents and, and influences among Catholic scholars. Um, so in many ways, these issues that I talked about already are still keeping us apart. Um, You know, it reminds me scripturally of how Jesus interacted with Judaism of the first century in some respects. They claimed, "We, we believe the Old Testament, we believe the true God, we believe that the Messiah is coming. Yeah, they denied Christ and his uh, claims about himself. But they had all these traditions that were functioning, at least, on par with, their, with the scriptures. And Jesus said, why do your dis-? well, they asked Jesus, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? 
for they did not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And his evaluation of those folks in his day was not a positive one. It wasn't a, well, you're close enough. Come here, brother. <laughs> you know, he, he, he was very clear. You know, if you don't acknowledge me, um, and if you're depending on these other things outside of, you're against God. Though you use the name of God, you're against him. And, you know, you look at, how, I know it doesn't go on as much today, perhaps, uh, at least overtly, but, you know, the reformers were put to death by the Catholic Church for these doctrines. And, uh, you know, that, that speaks volumes for how we might evaluate. I know we're kind of running out of time, but if you'll indulge me for not to make a pun there and in indulgences, but um, what sticks out to you about all of this that I shared? And what can we learn from this sort of historical look? They may say the same word, but what are their meanings? Yeah, I mean, that is... That's something to take with you when we're trying to contend for the faith and we're trying to take every thought captive, tearing down lofty arguments raised up against Christ. The enemy will be deceptive. That's how heresy is functioned. The enemy is pretty... Catholicism is still pretty hot for persecution in South America and Europe and uh, in uh, Hispanic parts of the world. So they're they're pretty hot persecution against against our uh, against Protestants and Protestant brothers. Yeah. Jason, do they allow their members to read the Bible now, or do they encourage it? Actually, it? that's one of the friendlier elements. There is an encouragement to to read it. Now, I don't know how that trickles down into the actual, you know, among the priests and the people, the laity and the local gatherings, but uh, that's sort of been the tone, anyway. Jason, I, uh, my brother-in-law was Catholic, very devout Catholic, and my sister-in-law converted to Catholicism in order to be married. But a number of years ago, I was at their house, and they had a little room that's kind of like an office that kind of overlooks the, the den area. Mm -hmm. Try to read through the Bible every year using the uh, tabletop. Mm -hmm. And so I left my Bible that I was reading with my sister in law, and she read through it that year. And, uh, and it was, it's kind of ironic that she would call me up as if I was a biblical scholar. And just by the grace of God, you would be teaching something or telling us. And you know, in Sunday school, and, or what, and I just, would have to have the answer to the question. Yeah. But uh, she was really, first time she ever read the Bible, first time. And her husband did not. And uh, he and I were talking. We, we, he, he owned a sailboat. We were going, uh, we sailed over the Block Island. And we were talking. And uh, he basically told me that that was the priest's job to read the Bible. It wasn't his. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and sadly that so many of them are entrenched in that that you know, the priest has been delegated to read the word, interpret the word, and tell me what it says. Yeah. With an author authoritative interpretation, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. no, exactly. They can't be questioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but you know, you 
Yeah. And just along with that, you know, how, okay, as Christians seeking to defend the truth yet love people, how should we think of Roman Catholics? How should we interact with them practically? You know, what, what do you think? What are some ideas? Yeah, yeah. Sure. And even back then, we were not strong Catholics. Okay. Uh, so anything that would come down mm -hmm. the pike, that would be fine with us. Uh, a Methodist friend of ours left the Methodist Church and joined the Catholic Church. This had been 25, 30 years ago. And her comment was that she was so excited when we met back together, she was so excited, she made the statement, I love being a Catholic. Now, I don't know how that sounds to y'all, but coming from a Catholic or some other uh, denomination, be it Methodist or whatever, uh, who just look at that church, that form of their religion, it becomes their religion. Mm. And uh, the thing that I can remember speaking to a minister that brought me and Mary uh, to the understanding of the Reformed doctrine, that became very special. Mm. It's nothing to do with the Presbyterian Church or the Baptist Church, whatever, because there are Presbyterian churches that I've not attended, and there are uh, Baptist churches that I've been in that sound like a Presbyterian church. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, the Catholic Church, I'm sure there are, there are saints in the Catholic Church that God has predestined and we'll see them and, and know them one of these days. But the sad thing about it I think the, the organization is not a Christian organization as such. Right. Really as yeah. such. Mm -hmm. uh, it has the crossings and so forth. Mm -hmm. But there's so many things that are just contrary to the word that even a simple person can understand. Right. So uh, I'm not proud to be a Presbyterian. I just thank God that, you know, that's... Right where he led me to start understanding the truth. Yeah. And, but anyway. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and you make some good points. I mean, I think, you know, from its organization and its official documents and the way that it's sort of explained in terms of these main doctrines and even the sacraments, it would be hard to say that it's a true church. And in fact, the reformers were convinced it's not. But what you said was good also that God is saving people. Mm -hmm. yeah. God's not dependent upon you know, these external things to accomplish his purposes. He is saving people out of the Catholic Church and bringing them to himself into a right understanding. And we can pray for that. Um, let me, let me say one yeah. Thing. Uh, my nephew, every time I go up there, he says, well, Everybody knows me, Tommy, and my family. And then my family's there. He said, Uncle Tommy, he said, you still trying to evangelize the world? <laughs> and, you know, because uh, I had been going on mission trips and so forth. Yeah. And, and Gideon passed out Bibles and so forth. And uh, I said, well, I said, that's an impossibility for me. But, you know, uh, I can't evangelize the people I meet. And, and that family, they know now that if we go out to eat, that we are going to say grace. So, you know, and now they expect it. And they always ask me to say it. So, you know, uh, what I'm having effect on them, I don't know. But, uh, but at least they know that they're giving us mm -hmm. I think it was interesting, too, Jason, when you said um, 
And I, I mean, we've talked about this, we probably have all known this, but Mary is, you know, in the Catholic Church sinless. But when you said it to my hate, it made it, you know, it, it made me think about it differently. And that means that Jesus really isn't Jesus. If that is really what they believe, because he would have to be born a person and God. So that, even in a conversation with a Catholic friend, we can talk through that. Just well, even in that, even in that doctrine, you know, why would you want to affirm a sinless Mary? Well, the the assumption is, if he was, she wasn't, then he would automatically be tainted. What does that say? That God's in- intervention is dependent mm-hmm. upon the condition of man mm-hmm. in order to be who he is. So there's just another example of an unbiblical assumption as opposed to, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And to extend this hour, yeah. uh, and I'm sure you've noticed that, the, that, the, uh, that Mary is mentioned more time in the Catholic uh, conversation, uh, prayers and so forth, than Christ. Yeah. And that's a, I mean, that, that to me, that's a thing. Yeah. That's only one of dozens and dozens of things. But you see, what goes back to that, that formal principle, Scripture alone, once that breaks and tradition is also allowed, mm-hmm. the floodgates are open yes. in terms of development of beliefs about certain things that become inspired uh, truths. Um, you know, in terms of Mary, I, f- I thought this was interesting in my brief study. You know, there's, um, and I know I'm keeping you guys longer than normal, but, um, you know, there's prayers to Mary. She's sinless. Um, she almost functionally is an inter- intercessor, an intermediary. And there's also a doctrine uh, that was, I believe, in... Uh, Where was it? The Assumption of Mary, 1950, that she bodily ascended from the grave. All these, put all these things together, it's Christ-like. Things that are talked about with Christ in the scriptures are being attributed to Mary in her position. Was somebody going to say something? No, you said, you talking about Co-mediatrix. Yeah, that yeah. Was, I've heard that term a lot, co-mediatrix, and uh, I've heard them use the term, the, the title, queen of the universe. and Mother of the church. And of the church, yeah. But, well, uh, yeah. Well, to answer the question that you made, is that how should we treat them? We should love them. They're our neighbors. They're our brothers and yep. sisters. And as Tom, because he, uh, he has had the opportunity because he has been observed mm-hmm. by his Catholic family, the people in his family who are Catholic, as to how he lives his life yes. and how he worships. And all of a sudden, they're asking questions. Mm-hmm. He leaves the Bible out, and his sister picks it up and reads it and, stu- and has questions about it. So we, we are witnessing in that sense because we are living our lives as, as we believe. I, you know, the reformed faith and what we believe that differs, but they, if they are observing us, then they're going to come up with questions. Mm-hmm. And then you have an opportunity to say, well, this is what we believe, or oh, this is... Yeah, so, yeah, very good summary there, Russ. I will say this, that uh, in Connecticut, there are not too many reformed churches. I can hear it that <laughs> my brother-in-law did seek out and find a reformed church for us. Wow. Well, let me pray for us real quick, and we'll be done. Uh, Lord, thank you for this time together. Pray that it was profitable. Um, Help us to be humble, Lord, with the truth that uh, you've revealed to us and the glorious promises we have in Scripture. Your word is truth. Help us not to just debate these things or win arguments, but submit ourselves to you and to live after Um, 
Christ and following after him and loving our neighbor, uh, as was mentioned, and being examples uh, and witnessing for your kingdom. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Sorry.